Hello, and welcome back to my Joppa tutorial series. Right now, you can see our finished product in our Eclipse workspace of episode 1, and we're going to start a new project for episode 2. Now today, we will be dealing with Java primitive data types, which I'm sure you all recognize because they're all mostly numbers. And we're going to do is set up our basic package and our main class. So here's a new blank, fresh, new main class. So we can um, print stuff out. We're just going to do our public static main, public static void main, string args. And we don't need this, but hey, why not? For later. That's why. Now, what primitive data types are, you might see, like, some of these words are highlighted purple. And that means they're Java keywords because of the um, IDE I'm using. So what happens, as in any programming language, there are variables. And no, not your customary math variables, but variables that you can set to certain things. And variables that you can actually use. More practically, I should say. Now there are several ones. These first four, which I'm not setting a value to yet are the four integer ones. Now these four integer ones they all hold what we um, colloquially know as integers and then there's these other ones which are floats. There are two floating point ones. There's there's a float and then there's a double and I'll explain all the differences between these sooner or later. Then there's a char and a string, but you might notice the string is not highlighted purple. We'll get to that soon. Okay, so let's focus on these first four integer ones. Now, you see that these are highlighted. Now, in normal, op in normal Java and some other object-oriented programming languages, when you set something, you set it equal to a new something. We could set it to a new byte if we wanted to because um, each primitive data type um, has a um, object that encases it but we don't need to talk about those yet these are primitive data types and what we can do we can set them to different literals now each one is different a byte is an 8-bit signed integer which means as a sign of 8 bits or one byte and it's signed which means its max its minimum value is negative its maximum value is positive and right in the middle is zero if it was unsigned its minimum would be zero and its maximum would just be just about twice as high as normal now what we can do I'm just gonna set each of these to their respective maximum values so for a byte it's very small it's 127 if you try to do 128 you'll get an error because it doesn't fit now if we try to do shorts, a short is slightly higher, it being a 16-bit signed value. I'm just copy and paste these values. Mm. So yeah, that has twice the capacity. As you know, they're not like twice as high number because how binary works is that uh, if you double it, you're increasing its value by a lot more than just doubling it to say the least. Then an integer's maximum is that minus the commas. So again, if you try to set this any higher, you'll get Now the integer is by far the most widely used of the primitive data types. Oh, I also forgot to add one. My apologies. It's a boolean. I misspelled it horribly. And basically, that holds easy, true, which is a keyword, or false. In short, they hold one bit, zero, or one. Those are mainly used for conditionals that we'll get to in a later episode. Now, let's get to long, which is the biggest integer you can hold on a Java system. It's that long. All right, when I get rid of these commas here, be able to explain to you some cool stuff. Now, one, this is the maximum value for long, but we're getting an error. Uh, we're getting an error because this literal 
which it's called a literal because we're not using the new keyword which is only used for objects but this literal of type integer it's an integer because it always defaults to integer it's out of range because right now this is an integer because what you need at the end of this is a capital L to denote that it's a long which is weird same goes for float now floats are 32-bit sign integers same as same bits as an integer and double is the same bit size as a long which means it has similar capacities but we can just type out like 256 point bleh. and we have, since it's a float we have to type a lowercase f at the end lowercase f and for a double we can write uh, I don't know, 32767 dot uh, with a lowercase d. Now you have a float and a double. This, of course, makes things more accurate and such. Now, the only reason you would tend to use like a byte or a short as opposed to an integer or a long is that they use a lot less memory. Not a lot less, but a, a good amount less. So, like, if you were making a game, and for your game save files, you only needed to save like 200, like 127 or 255 different types of things. Then you could use byte as opposed to setting all those using integers, which would quadruple at at the very least quadruple the data that it takes, and that would obviously not only clog hard drives but would also mug down the runtime environment. The next thing are chars or characters and then strings which are very special now characters alone chars are special in that they can either be set with to characters which are a single they use single quotes strings we use double quotes so characters use single quotes so we can do that we can do a white space we can do a tab normally we can do a tab we can only use the code for that now what happens if you don't know this whenever you press anything into your keyboard, your computer interprets it as a ASCII or Unicode ASCII or Unicode <laughs> uh, encoded uh, integer. Since you can't just like A, you can't really put it directly into Boolean since Boolean zeros and ones. And what they do with ASCII or um, Unicode is that they encode characters into integers and then zeros and ones and hexadecimal and octal and other stuff we, we don't have to worry about that yet so basically an A can also be represented by a certain string which is four digits long I have no idea what um, character that is but you see it's still valid so it's still a character and also if you put zero X at the top it just denotes even special and these four characters can be hexadecimal which is special which means it's one through it's uh, 0 through 9 with an extra A through F. So we can set an F here. And it would still be perfectly valid because it's hexadecimal. hexadecimal. But if we set a G, G is not hexadecimal. So F, or we can do even like D. Now I honestly have no idea what that is, but if we have it print out car 1, char 1, my apologies. One second. You see that public static void is static, and in order to use... Um, in order to use variables in a static method, the variable has to be static. Again, we'll go over this in a future episode, but I'm just going to quickly do that. Now we can run this and see that my mysterious character is a question mark. Now let me see if I change it. It's also a question mark. Oh. Hmm. Peculiar. If we take the 0x out of there and change that. Hmm, I'm dumbfounded. But I know there's a certain way to get that to work, but either way, you can just set that up. Set that up. You can look up your own Unicode codes on the internet. Wikipedia has an extensive article about it with all of them listed, and you can enter them in and use them. So we're just going to set this to why not in capital S. Now, for instance, to figure it out, we can make a static integer uh, 
char 2 equals char 1. Now, if we output char 2, he's hoping it'll give us an integer, and it did. So that means 83, capital S, is 83. So if we set this to 83, and we now make it print out char 1, it should give us a capital S. And there you go. It works. Okay. What I might have been doing is that my value might have been too large, and Unicode, Unicode doesn't go that large. So maybe... Just testing now. If I go do that, oh wait, and maybe not. Okay, um, screw it. Doesn't matter anymore. You get you get the idea of what um, a char is. Now strings, the special little cases. Strings are extend object, which is the one of the most basic things in Java. Not not basic, but one of the most commonly used things in Java since everything by default would extend um, object. But, but you know, boolean or and all these keywords don't extend object and that's one of the reasons why they can be set to literals. But strings, surprise, can also be set to literals. So here you go, that's a literal. Now how you would normally do it with any other object that like wasn't a string would you do would equal new what it is, and there are some other special exceptions, like you can use children classes, but we'll definitely get onto that much later. So new string, goodbye world. So if we type in string one, followed by string two, they'll out they'll um output their respective values. So say hello world, goodbye world. So another thing you can also do with strings is concatenation, which is a is a, a big word that means just put together, put end to end stuff like that. So if we do static string string three equals string one plus string two, that means we concatenated string one and string two. Which is, you know, just fancy. So if we put in string 3 here, it'll put up a disgusting amalgamation of it. So it'll be, you know, no separation. Now what we can also do with strings is that we can concatenate it with literals as well. So put a nice little space there. It suddenly looks more appealing. Well, as appealing as it could. It's just a string. And then another thing you can do with strings is that the um, certain things you can do with backslashes in fact forget what they're called I'll get with them to a later episode but a backslash then a certain value like there's many ones like n or r or maybe p but n is most commonly used n is a line separator or carriage return or whenever you press enter so whenever you press enter that doesn't go with, without um, inserting a byte of data into your computer either so whenever you press enter it inserts a uh, a line separator string, which is different on different operating systems, but Java universally uses n. You can also use mod, um, modulo n, which uh, I guess we'll get into arithmetic in about the lesson with that also has arrays. So we'll do that. You can also do modulo n, but that's not system independent. Backslash n is. So if we just play, I mean run, you can see they're now separated by lines. When we did it before, when we did string one and then a separate print line to string two, print line just automatically appends a, a new line symbol at the end when it's done um, printing the string. So if we took away ln or line, there's also a command called print. So if we did, if we printed string one and then string two, you will come to realize that they're on the same line. So print line is just convenience, just to make sure everyone's on everyone's on a different line. But, you know, if we print string three, we have our own line separator in there, so it'll work perfectly fine. Now, there are tons of other things you do with strings, like we can do string three. And now we can put dot to see all of the sub thing, all the different things you can get. I mean, whenever there's stuff like this, you can just look through it on your own. Like you can do um, character at, which means you do this, you give it a certain index, 
and everything starts with zero. So if we counted from hello, we'll just put five in here right now, and we'll actually just put that in here. But so if we do character the character at position five. So if we count to hello world, there'll be H, which is zero, E, E, which is one. L which is 2, L which is 3, L which is 4, and comma which is 5. So if we if, if I counted right, the system should print out a single comma and that it did. There's your comma. And you know there's a whole bunch of other ones. Again, if you like hover over it even, you'll see this appears over here. It tells you exactly what it does, returns the character value at the specified index. Tells you the parameters, tells you the returns, tells you the throws. And I'll be able to tell you how to do that on your own things, on your own methods and variables and such, when we get to the episode that has to do with basic concepts of object oriented programming languages. But as for um, primitive data values and literals and all that, I think we covered everything that you need to know except for one thing. Of course, just had to remember. New in Java 1.7 happens to be um, when you declare integer literals, whether it be whether it be a long int, short, or byte, you can enter underscores in between them. Now, this only the only thing that this does is make it more pleasing to the eye for whoever is looking at the source code. So, if we did like system print line. Pardon my spelling, and we did that. It's just gonna print out 127, not one underscore underscore two underscore seven. It also works when you're doing basic arithmetic with it. One of the most useful things that you may find to do with this is when you're trying to type out either social security card numbers, phone numbers, or credit card numbers in programming. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can do like one two three four, one two three four, one two three four, four three two one, YOLO. And there, now it's just more pleasing to the eye. Eye. There are certain places you can't place them, like at the beginning of the literal, or in between the literal and its letter identifier, or on floating points, you can't put it adjacent to the decimal point. And you most certainly can't put it after the determination letter. So, I think that about covers this lesson, and I'll see you next time when we cover... Arrays and arithmetic.